want to be in God's will. So just stop by their table, talk to them, pick up a prayer card, and let's bless this family. So this morning, we're continuing our series talking about the Old Testament stories, but it's not just a story. There's more to the story. There's more that is hidden behind the story. And, uh, and today, I want to talk to you a little bit about Elijah and uh, kids. In your, in your little baggies that you got, you have a little coloring sheet, but it's just not a coloring sheet. There's information that you can read there about Elijah and the way he prayed. And so we hope that you will, you will take that and you will color, but also have conversations with your parents about this morning's message. And I just want to let parents know as we start, man, if your kids get loud, it's all cool. I'm fine. We're all fine. Just relax. We're in church. This is what it's supposed to be. Uh, I, last week, we had an individual that walked up to me and said, man, church finally felt like it was alive again. That means we adults need to get a little louder. Yeah. Maybe we can learn from the kids. We get so quiet, and then when we get, hear noise, we kind of get all scary and go, whoa, what's wrong with church, right? Because church has gone dead. It needs to come alive again, yes. right? Amen. I love it. Let's have some energy in God's house, right? How many of you guys go to uh, the Chiefs game or the Royals game, and you sit quietly like this? I'm just saying. How many of you get all upset when a kid starts yelling, go Chiefs, go Patrick Mahomes? I'm just saying. <laughs> but we get to church and we go, oh, let's all get so quiet. But you know what? Heaven's going to be quiet. I, I, I guarantee you that. <laughs> it's going to be loud. <laughs> so, hey, it's all cool. So this morning... Um, hey, uh, I just want to talk to you a little bit about Elijah and his prayer life. But to help us, um, we, uh, we're getting ready to go on a little vacation here in July. And we're going to the Rocky Mountains. Have you been to the Rocky Mountains? Man, I love the Rocky Mountains. I've been to Rocky Mountains. I've been to uh, the Smoky Mountains in Tennessee. Uh, any Smoky Mountain fans? I, I love them both. But man, there's something about the Rocky Mountains that I love. And, and we love being outdoors. We love the nature. Man, the moose, my wife is praying we see more moose like that. But that was like from me to... Uh, I'd say Roy. Uh, it was a big mama moose, and there were two baby moose right next to it. It was so, so cool. And you know, I talked to my wife. There was a, a, a big a bull that charged me, too. I thought I was dead, and, but it, we're all good. Um, I'm still here, and we're, we're hoping we'll see more of those. Uh, but it is so cool. We got to see uh, elk. We got to r horseback ride, man, the mountains, hiking, the rivers. Man, you hike, and you see things you don't see driving along the highway. Uh, and there's so much beauty. But here's the thing, uh, we've been to the Rocky Mountains, and, and, and uh, every time, every, we try to plan a vacation to the Rocky Mountains every two to three years because of how much we enjoy it. Uh, my daughter graduated, and she's like, so do you want to go to the beach or do you want to go to the mountains? We like both. She's like, I want to go to the mountains. We want to go hike. We want to go check out the wildlife. And because there is something that happens when we're out in nature. And the reason we enjoy it, now some of you are like, oh, that sounds good. How many of you have not been to the Rocky Mountains? Okay, you guys are like, that sounds great, right? It sounds good. I should consider it. But when you've been there, you know for sure, right? Because you've been there. You've smelt the, wa you smelt the air. You, you've experienced the atmosphere. You've seen the wildlife. You've seen it. And because you've seen it, you know what you, you I mean, it's not, nothing like being there and seeing it for yourself, right? And, and, and so prayer is the same thing. God's word says, taste and see that I am good, right? Now, you might hear the, the whole concept of prayer. Man, that sounds really good. But till you've truly experienced it, you really don't know what happens when you pray. And when you experience it, you're like, man, I can't get away from not praying. Okay? Prayer reveals to us, it reveals to us, we're able to see God's power and love. I can tell you everything about God's power and love, but till you experience it, it's only going to be my story. Till you go to the Rocky Mountains and you see the wildlife, if you love wildlife, if you don't, sorry. But if you see the wildlife and you go, man, I love wildlife, you see it and you're there, you're like, I want to go back, right? Do you want to go back to prayer every day? Because you've been there and you've seen the power of God, you've seen His love. It reveals to us God who is actively working for the good of those who love Him and serve His people. Like Matt and Amy. Prayer is an action, but it's also a place. 
It's an action where we are obedient, but it's also a place that we come to meet with the King of kings and the Lord of lords, where we get to stand in His presence and we get to stare into His face and we experience His presence and we sense all of the, the good stuff that happens by being in the presence of God. And we say, man, I cannot not be there because I enjoy being there. Do you have that experience? And if you don't, I want to I wanna encourage you this morning to, to be intentional about prayer. So I'm going to give you some statements. And as I give you these statements, these might resonate with your life right now, the season of life that you're in. And I want you to take this personally. I want you to apply it and you'll say the, ask the question, if I'm in this season right now, should I step out in prayer? Should I? In the midst of chaos, crisis, corruption, and confusion, Prayer leads to clarity. You want clarity this morning? You want clarity in the midst of chaos, crisis, corruption, confusion? In the midst of fear and failure, prayer leads to freedom. In the midst of hurt and loss, prayer leads to healing and life. In the midst of persecution and pressures of life, prayer leads to peace. And I've, I've made this statement before during our prayer series, but whoever controls the altar controls the outcome. If, if you are in control with God's power, if you are spending time in the presence of God, if you're at the altar spending time and, and the altar is controlled by God, then the outcomes of your life are what God has for your life. And we'll see that this morning. So this morning, we want to go back to an Old Testament story, and not just a story, but to, to learn the hidden truths that there is in this story. And we want to, we'll be spending time in 1 Kings. So if you have your Bibles, if you turn with me to 1 Kings, we'll be in chapter 16, chapter 17, and chapter 18. Now, I'm not going to read through all of these, and I encourage you, it's a really cool story to go back and read through chapter 16, 17, and 18, and even 19, and see what God is doing through the prophet. Uh, Elijah, and, and so I just want to unpack this story. You're just like in any story, there is a good guy and a bad guy. Kids, have you guys watched the movies where you see it's always a good guy and then there is a bad guy, right? The good guy is taking out the bad guy, the bad guy is trying to kill the good guy, right? That's kind of most of the stories that we have, right? And so in this story, we have a king by the name of Ahab, okay? Fun name, right? Ahab. <laughs> Everybody say Ahab. You guys are good. Man, you guys should be up here. The king's name is Ahab, and he's been ruling in Israel, in Samaria, for 22 years. Now, Samaria is the northern part of, uh, 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 of the state, and in the southern part is Judah. And Ahab was uh, evil <laughs> in the Lord's sight. Now, he was a king. He was a king placed to rule the people of Israel, but this guy was an evil person, that means he was the villain, he was a bad guy in the sight of the Lord. Even evil, he, 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 was, uh, he, was, he, he was even more uh, eviler, is that a word, eviler? I just made that up. Okay, it's a new word for you today, evil, uh, than the previous kings that had come before him. Okay, he was, he was creating new things that had never been seen before. And there was this evil that was happening with this king. And then guess what happens? This king marries Jezebel, another cool name, Jezebel, the daughter of King Edbal from Sidonia. And he began to bow down and worship Baal. Okay, here we go. So here is this evil king doing bad stuff. And then he marries this lady that is from another kingdom who worships another God, not our God, not the, the God of Israel, but another God by the name of Baal. And what happened to King Ahab? He was an evil guy, now was starting to worship another God. And what we know about Jezebel, that she was pretty evil herself. She was like on the top of the list when it came to doing evil acts. Not only did he worship the king of ba Baal, but, but Ahab built a temple in Samaria for the god of Baal. Talk about idol worship to its max. 
So he builds this temple and he says, guess what? Everyone needs to worship this God of Baal. And he sets up these Asherah poles, which are like these wooden poles that were like idols that were built to worship these gods. Uh, or the Asherah God, which was the mother god of all gods in that time. And so Baal was uh, a, an offspring of a, uh, the god Asherah. So it's kind of really evil in this time. <laughs> He did more to provoke anger, provoke the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than any other king had done before him. So we really have a bad guy here. <laughs> He's really bad. And then we have a good guy. The good guy, prophet, uh, a prophet, a man of God, Elijah. Okay, and, and kids, you have that coloring sheet that shows him. He's, he's God's representative that is here. And Elijah is called to announce God's judgment against this disobedient, disobedient king. Imagine being that guy. He gets to go to the king and say, hey, guess what? You're messing up, dude. God's going to punish you. You're, you're being evil. You need to stop doing what you're doing. <laughs> he gets to be that guy, <laughs> Elijah. How does Elijah do all of this? And we're going to see this. Because Elijah, Elijah can't do this in his own power. Elijah is going up against some very powerful forces. How many of you feel that way right now in your life? As if you're going up against some powerful forces that are trying to bring you down. And Elijah is in that state. And so we pick up the story in 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse 1. 1 Kings 17 verse 1. And he says, Now Elijah, who was from Tosh, uh, Tishbe in Gil Gilead, told King Ahab, As surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, the God that I serve, here's what he says, there will be no dew or rain during the next few years until I give the word. Now, we don't know what that looks like, right? No rain. Do you guys know what it looks like to have no rain? Because we've had so much rain, right? Go back a few years, you'll know what it looks like. <laughs> but, but the king's like, Elijah is telling the king, guess what? As surely as my God lives, the God that I serve, there's not going to be any rain in your world for the next few years. That's a bold statement, right? This is the king. God was going to hold back the rain in that land for three and a half years. Uh, this was w one way of God using uh, Elijah to mock the God of Baal. Because the God of Baal was responsible for rain. He was responsible for uh, agriculture. They worshipped the God of Baal so that they, they, they would have good crop and that there would be rain in, the, in, that, in, that, uh, in that nation. And so God was saying, hey, guess what? <laughs> I'm going to shut down what you worship. I'm going to shut down what you worship. Okay? And sometimes God tends to do that in our lives, right? We tend to worship all these different things, and God goes, uh, maybe I need to get your attention here. Let me shut it down for a while. Let's see what that looks like. Let's see if you come back to me. Because you've been relying on yourself for too long, right? And he says, I'm going to shut the rain down. The New Testament states that this drought came as a result of Elijah's powerful prayer. And we read that in, in James chapter 5, verse 17. Here is what it says in the New Testament. James 5, 17. Elijah was a human being even as we are. There was no supernatural power that Elijah had. He was just a human being just like you and me. That's what the Word of God says. But what did he do? He prayed. What does it say? He prayed. He prayed earnestly, and it would, we would not, uh, that it would not rain, and it did not rain in the, on, in the land for three and a half years. I think we've shared this before, that God is up there, but he wants to collaborate with you and me to accomplish the things of this world. Do you think God was collaborating with Elijah to bring about his plan? God wants to collaborate with you and me to bring about his plan in our lives, in our marriages, in our families, in our communities, in our churches. But he wants us to pray earnestly so that his plan can be accomplished through you and me. And so we see that happening in Eli through Elijah. Whoever controls the altar controls the outcome, right? 
Then the Lord said to Elijah, because guess what? Ahab's mad now. It's like, how dare you do that? So he's coming after uh, Elijah, but the Lord was going to take care of his man, right? The Lord said to Elijah, go to the east and hide by uh, Kirit Brook near, uh, near where it enters the Jordan River. Drink from the brook and eat what the ravens bring you, for I have commanded them to bring you food. So what is God saying? Guess what? You've been bold. You have done what I've asked you to do, but I will take care of you. I will protect you. I will provide for you. He's our protector. He's our provider. When we rely on him, when we pray earnestly, when we seek him, he says, I can take care of you no matter what storm comes your way, no matter who is trying to attack you, right? So Elijah did what the Lord told him, and he camped near uh, Kirit Brook, east of the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat, and each morning and evening he drank from the brook. But after a while, uh-oh, the brook dried up, for there was no rain anywhere in the land. Houston, we have a problem. We're out of water. <laughs> what am I going to do? No water, right? <laughs> There's no water. So, so here we go. In the midst of chaos, in the midst of crisis, in the midst of corruption, in the midst of confusion, prayer leads to what? Clarity. So what does Elijah do? He prays. Elijah prays and goes, hmm, God, you brought me out here. You gave me water and, and you brought me food. Now the, the river is dry. What do we do? What happens? Verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came to him. <laughs> God spoke to him. God revealed truth. Remember, Elijah is just like you and me, right? Do you need God to speak to you this morning? Do you need clarity? Do you need direction? Are you confused? Is that chaos in your life? Because there was, right? Then the word of the Lord came to him. Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. <laughs> It's kind of funny because in those days, the widows were not the most rich people. They were the poor. They were the outcasts. They didn't have a lot. They didn't have a lot of wealth. They were not powerful. The widows, they were kind of the, the, the left over on the side, right? And God's saying, I'm going to take care of you through a widow. I want you to be obedient. I want you to go meet this widow. But the word of the Lord came to Elijah because he prayed. And what did Elijah do? Did Elijah go, that doesn't make sense, God. That doesn't line up with my logic. That doesn't work. That's not how the world operates, God. No, he obeyed God. He obeyed God. How many times do we not obey God because it doesn't make sense to us? We say it doesn't line up with my logic. I'm going to think through my brain, and if it doesn't make sense, oh, God doesn't know what he's talking about. I'll just do what I need to do, right? But Elijah obeyed, and he went. And what happened? Because of Elijah's obedience... Elijah goes to his widow and he says, guess what? I'm here. God told me to come to see you. You're going to feed me. You're going to take care of me. I'm going to hang out with you. I'm going to live in your house. She's like, what? I'm a widow. I don't have enough to feed myself. And there's a drought in this world, in this country right now. What are you talking about? Right? Verse 12, as surely as the Lord your God lives. Now, he does, she does recognize that this is a man of God. She says, as surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. <laughs> I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat and die. So the widow is like, hey, this is my last meal. I mean, what are you, you coming here to tell me to take care of you, but I don't even have anything left. This is it. I'm going to eat, and I'm going to, just me and my son, and we're going to call it good, and well, well, this is it. Life is hard. Things are falling apart in this widow's life. But a man of God was with her. And here's what we need to understand. People of, people of God walk with the hope of God. People of God walk with the hope of God. And here is what I want to tell you, Flag Church. You are the people of God. This world is lost. This community is lost. People in your family are lost. They don't know what's happening. Things are falling apart. But you have hope. And, and we choose not to walk in that hope. We choose not to operate in that hope. But when we have the Spirit of the living God in us, 
We have the hope of the living God, and we bring hope not just to ourselves, but we bring hope to everyone else around us. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. <laughs> hey, it's all good. Don't worry. Just go home and do as you have said. Be, but, but first, make a small loaf of bread for me. Elijah kind of sounds a little selfish, right? It's like, I know, you got a son, but just take care of me first. Give me some bread. I'll be happy, right? What you have, uh, and, and bring it to me. And then make some for you and your, uh, for, some for yourself and your son. For, but Elijah knew something. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. The jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain in the land. Man. How did Elijah know that? Because he prayed. Because he had a conversation. Elijah didn't have this magic globe that told him, no, no, he, he prayed. He prayed to the God of the living, the living God. That told him, hey, here's what I want you to tell this widow, because here's what I'm going to do. And most of the statements Elijah is making here are pretty bold statements. It's not going to rain for three and a half years. Hey, your jug is not going to run out of oil, and, and the flower is going to keep going. Is that logical statements? Pretty bold statements, huh? You and I worship the same God. Nothing has changed. She went away and did as Elijah told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. And the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not dry out. It, it, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. What do you think is happening to the faith of this widow? <laughs> oh my goodness. She's like, whoa, look at a miracle here. Miracles happen, people. We just have to pray to see the hand of God. In the midst of fear and failure, in the midst of fear and failure, what happens? Prayer leads to freedom. And we get to experience the faithfulness of God in our life. So, everything's going good. And then, boom, guess what? Bad stuff happens again. Here we go. Life, right? Roller coaster, up and down. This is how our lives are. What happens? Her son gets sick. And sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, what do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Wow, she's like bringing it. But man, she just lost her son. So what does Elijah do? He does the only thing he knows what to do. <laughs> He has a conversation with God. He prays. God, I don't know what to do. I'm just here. I'm obedient to you. I'm not the man that's doing all this stuff. You're the one. I'm just a conduit, right? The pressure is not on us. The pressure is on God. We just have to be willing and obedient to be used and be a conduit. And here we go again. Verse 20, then he cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, have you brought tragedy even on this widow I am staying with? By causing her son to die? So Elijah is like questioning God. He's like, he's being real here. God, what's going on here? I mean, why would you do this? But then what does he do? Then he stretched himself on, out on the boy three times and cried out to the Lord. What did he do? He prayed. He prayed. The only thing he knows how to do. That's the only thing Elijah is good at, praying. There's some powerful stuff happening. He prayed to the Lord, Lord my God, let this boy's life return to him. Did he make a bold statement there? Yeah. He just had a conversation. God said, God, here we go. You brought me here. Now here's the situation. I need you to show up. The Lord heard Elijah's cry. And the boy's life returned to him, and he lived. <laughs> and he lived. In the midst of hurt, loss, prayer leads to life and healing. Prayer is powerful. Prayer is powerful. Now we have a scene change. 
So Elijah's been doing this three and a half years. It hasn't been raining, right? It, and God says, Elijah, it's time. Let's have a showdown here. Let's have a throwdown, <laughs> okay? It's like Bobby Flay throwdown. Have you guys the Food Channel? You guys seen it? No, some of you are like, yes, I've seen it. The rest of you are like, what are you talking about? Go check it out. Bobby Flay throwdown, okay? But let's do a throwdown here. Let's show these gods who I am. So he sends Elijah to go back to King Ahab. And he says, I want you to go back to King Ahab. I want you to tell, the, tell him to bring all of his gods of Baal. And let's have a throwdown. Let's, let's have this, this whole thing that's going to happen. So Elijah goes and he says, hey, guess what? You've got all these gods. And you've got this God and you've got all these prophets, 450 of them that are worshiping the God of Baal. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to build an altar. I want you to sacrifice an animal on that altar. And you're going to start praying to the God of Baal to send down fire to burn up the offering that has been placed to your God. And guess what? If that happens, you know that your God is for real. But if that doesn't happen, I'm going to pray to my God and let's see what happens. And let's put an end to this craziness. Let's decide who the real God is, right? And so he calls, uh, 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 calls out on the prophets. So they show up. They build an altar. They put the, the animal on it. And they call out to their God. It's morning. They're calling out. It's late morning. They're calling out. It's lunchtime. They're calling out. It's afternoon. They're calling out. They're like, man, maybe God's asleep, says Elijah. Shout, try a little louder because he may not hear you. So they start yelling. They start screaming, calling out to their God. Doesn't show up. They start taking extreme measures. <laughs> They start cutting themselves because it's like worship to the God, right? They start doing evil stuff to themselves. They start harming themselves because they think if they do that, maybe this God will show up. How many times do we have gods in our life like that, <laughs> that we have set up? Maybe our finances, maybe our fame, maybe our power, maybe our possessions that we go after. And sometimes we don't get what we want, so we put a little extra into that. We go to extreme measures because we want to see our God come alive, right? <laughs> but it never happens. And they keep doing it, and they keep doing it, and nothing's happening. And Elijah is, okay, you guys done? You guys done? It's like, okay, let me build my altar. So he builds the altar to the living God. And, and, um, and, and then he says, let's place the, the offering on the altar. And in verse uh, chapter 17, verse 32, at the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are the God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things that you commanded. Answer me, Lord, answer me. So these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. What happens? Verse 38. Then, fire of the, then the fire of the Lord fell and burnt up the sacrifice, the wood, the stone, the soil, and, and also licked up all the water in the trench. And, and if you want a little more context about what happened, go back and read all of chapter 17. When the people saw this, what did they do? The people that were worshipping the God of Baal, the people that were worshipping all the idols, what did they do? They fell prostrate and cried, Lord, He is God, and the Lord, He is God. They acknowledge who the real God is. They worship the real God because of Elijah's obedience, because of Elijah's praying, because of Elijah's being, uh, having faith in the living God. God used Elijah to bring hope to a lost generation. Just like he's using Matt and Amy to go into South Thailand. And we pray and we believe that God's going to use them. Just like he's called you to Pittsburgh, to Front Neck, to Gerard, to Fort Scott, to Southeast Kansas. Because there are people that are lost that need Jesus, that are worshiping idols, that don't have hope, that are putting their hope in the wrong stuff. Maybe in their finances, maybe their possession, maybe in relationships, maybe in fame, whatever it is. And there's brokenness. And they're harming themselves. Worshipping a hopeless God. And God's saying, hey, I can use you to work the miracle, to reveal to them that I am the real God. And when they see that, because of your obedience, because of your prayer, guess what they will do? They will bow down and worship me. And I will bring hope and healing into their lives. 
What happened at the moment that the people started worshiping the real God? Verse 41, and Elijah said to Ahab, Ahab the king, go eat and drink, for there is the sound of heavy rain. Elijah shut the water with the power of God. He's getting ready to open the floodgates by the power of God because he prayed. Ahab went off to eat and drink. But Elijah climbed. Here's the thing. Elijah knew that it was going to rain, but did he stop there? He said, oh God, it's done. I'm done. No. What does Elijah do? He climbed on top of a camel. I don't know why a camel, but I'm sure there's context that I need to research there. Bent down on the ground, put it, uh, bent to the ground, put his face between his knees. What did he do? He was praying. He said to his servant, go look ahead towards the sea. And he went and looked. There was nothing there. He said seven times, Elijah said, go back. The seventh time the servant reported, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. So Elijah said, go tell Ahab, hitch your chariots and go down before the rain stops. Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds, wind rose, heavy rain started falling, and Ahab rode off to uh, Jezreel. It started to rain. Freedom, hope, healing, restoration. God wants to pour that into your lives. But seven times he prayed. And then in the Bible, the, uh, the number seven in Scripture symbolizes something that is full and complete. Elijah shows that he understood the power of complete and continuous intercession. Not to give up halfway, but to go all in, to continue to keep praying. If you don't get the answer, to continue to keep praying, to continue to trust God, not to take your own alternative action, but to stay in God's plan. You keep praying, keep trusting, keep believing, because God shows up in the right time. And when He shows up, man, isn't it awesome? And with this, reasons for prayer. Number one, because God wants a relationship, companionship. You or I were created for companionship. God wants us to be in relationship. Prayer is a conversation that we have with the Father to be in relationship. God wants that. Number two, to connect us, to be connected, to help us understand God's plan and purpose and power for our lives. Elijah knew what was happening. Elijah knew what was coming down the pipeline. He was connected to the Father. He knew exactly what to say. God wants to do that through you and me. He wants us to stay connected so that we will know what to say. We will know how to act. We will know what path to take. We will know what door to open. We will know what job to, re to accept. We will know who to marry. We we will know how to bring up our kids to stay connected so that life will flow through us. And when life flows through us, it flows to everyone around us. And thirdly, to be co-workers. God wants to use you to be in collaboration, to do the work that God has called us to do here on this earth. Whatever your vocation is, God called you to that vocation, but not just to that vocation, to use you in that vocation to reach the lost. How are you being used? Are you being a co-worker? So here's where I want to end this morning. How many of you agree prayer is powerful? I want you to show, raise your hand if you agree prayer is powerful. Do you see God working through prayer? Okay, good. This month is a month of family. Family with kids and and, and we, we want to take a moment this morning to be intentional. We want to use prayer. We've seen how prayer has been powerful. How many of you agree that our next generation is struggling right now? The depression rates are high. Suicidal rates are high. A lot of our next generation is losing hope in the living God. And there's a whole other message I'd love to preach right now about how the Word of God talks us that it's our responsibility as parents, not the church, not the school, not the government, but the, the responsibility of parents to teach their kids in the ways of the Lord. And if you teach them, when they grow up, they will not walk away from it. It's not the church's responsibility. It's not the government. It's not the school. It is the parents' responsibility. 
But part of that flag church, and that's why we've given you this book, but part of that is to pray for our kids, to pray God's blessing, God's provision, God's, God's guidance and direction, God's plan for their life, not your plan. Man, when you bring your plan into your kids' lives, it can get messy because your plan may not be God's plan. But when you're connected to God, you know what God's plan is.